This conference better. will now be recorded. Hi. Um, yes, so my presentation is entitled Masonry Arch Bridges Limit States. Um, as Paul's mentioned, I'm from the University of Sheffield uh, and I'm going to be uh, sharing uh, some of my um, collected ex experience uh, of uh, Masonry Arch Bridges over the years. So this is uh, the breakdown of today's uh, presentation. I'll give a little bit of historical background, um, talk about how arches and arch bridges work, then look at uh, something called uh, a limit states, so ultimate limit state and permissible limit state that we uh, deal with when we are, uh, um, are assessing masonry arch bridges. I'll look at a case study railway bridge, and then finally, um, so a little bit about some current research we're doing and then wrap up with a Q&A. On this particular slide, I've got uh, an annotated diagram of a masonry arch bridge. And just to sort of make apologies in advance, there's, there's quite a lot of jargon associated with masonry arch bridges. So if I mention voussoirs, these are the stones that form the arch barrel. Um, the arch barrel, which can be formed from single or multiple rings of masonry blocks, bricks or, or stones. Um, the area above the arch is the spandrel area. So we have spandrel walls and also spandrel fill material. So apologies for that. Um, please do uh, add in add in the in the chat any any queries if I, if you're not clear what I'm referring to. And as has been mentioned, uh, I'm director of the uh, Integrated Civil and Infrastructure Research Centre, so the University of Research Centre, and it's really focusing on on two areas. One is looking after existing infrastructure and, and masonry arch bridges primarily fall into that category but also developing new essentially low carbon infrastructure um, using uh, um, emerging uh, construction techniques okay so in terms of masonry bridges just uh, say a few words about uh, wh where they came from um, the slide shown on screen now uh, is a nice slide um, of uh, one of the earliest arches known uh, to be uh, uh, have been constructed in, in Iraq or Mesopotamia, as it was then called. So clearly, um, masonry arch bridges, uh, uh, sorry, masonry arches have been around for, for many uh, millennia. Uh, perhaps most sort of famously, the Romans used arches very widely. Um, got the famous uh, Pont de Garde aqueduct shown on screen, and they're characterised by semicircular arches and very uh, sort of sturdy construction. So, for example, the piers between arches were generally quite quite stocky, so that uh, if one of the arches is removed, then um, structure would still still stay um, in uh, in position. And it meant that they could build these these structures span by span. Uh, rather than having to build all the spans uh, together. Um, however, um, the, the downside of that is you need uh, uh, more masonry. Um, and for multi-span bridges, I guess the, the field was, was revolutionised by Perrinet, a French engineer in the uh, 18th century, who showed that uh, Actually, you could get away having quite slender piers, uh, long spans, and, 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 and quite uh, insubstantial piers if you actually constructed each of the spans together and then you took the centering or the formwork supporting each arch away all at the same time. Um, the downside is that if you don't, um, if you do take a span away, then bad things happen. This is quite a, a well known video of a, a demolition of a bridge in Scotland, I think in 1989 from, from memory. So that explains the, uh, the outfits that people are wearing and also the low quality of the video. So basically we have um, a multi-span bridge which is being demolished and the people demolishing it don't really seem to have much idea as to how it's gonna behave when it is demolished. So they're just finishing off the demolition of the first span and you can see then there's an out of balance thrust. So the next span goes, and then the next span, 
and then the next band and some quite startled cameraman <laughs> are rushing away who clearly were not expecting um, that domino effect. And that, that's a kind of uh, um, um, what you would expect. Unfortunately, it's not particularly, um, not, not widely known in the field. Unfortunately, I think uh, in the early 90s, there were a couple of people killed on a, um, uh, it would have been a, a, a rail track uh, or British Rail Bridge um, when uh, a span was um, demolished and there were people working under one of the adjacent spans and they hadn't expected um, that progressive collapse. Um, so examples of, of UK bridges, um, that the tens of thousands of these bridges around in the UK, we think about 70,000 spans. Um, just pick out one or two notable examples. This is the bridge at Pontypris, built by William Edwards in 1755. It's notable actually because um, it took multiple attempts to actually uh, achieve a bridge that, that would actually stay in place. And the problem was that the, that the, um, the previous attempts, the, the arch in relation to the applied loading was not the right shape. And the way it was achieved in, in, in the end was actually by putting in these, these openings to actually provide less weight at the, um, at, the, at the sort of haunch areas and end, end up uh, realizing the span, which was believed to be the, the longest single span bridge at the time in the world. Another UK example, a little bit later, 1833, um, again, believed to be the, uh, the longest stern bridge at the time of construction. This is the, the Grosvenor Bridge in Tester, and that's still, um, as the Pontypri Bridge is, still happily uh, carrying loading. But these uh, sort of predate the, the heyday of the, uh, of the railways, and uh, if we move on to the railways, there are, there are many notable bridges carrying railway traffic. One of the most famous is, is Ribblehead Viaduct, uh, which I photographed a couple of months ago when I was cycling on a coast-to-coast on a -coast bike ride from, from Morecambe to Scarborough. So it's looking as fine as, as usual uh, in, the, uh, in the sort of uh, remote moorland of the, uh, the Yorkshire Dales. So in terms of um, the numbers of masonry arch bridges on the UK rail network, uh, the numbers are, 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 are very high. So of the, the underbridges uh, carrying uh, railway loading, approximately half the spans are actually uh, of, of masonry construction. Predominantly brick, but also stone, and there are also um, some um, masonry bridges which are, which are fabricated using actually uh, precast concrete uh, blocks as well, but are still masonry. Um, bridges. Um, one of the problems um, facing the, the, the sort of asset manager or the, the assessment engineer is these take a huge range of forms. So even considering brick construction, often augmented with stone and in different places, as you can see in these uh, these shots here. So dive into um, some engineering, how do these things work? Um, well, they're pretty pretty simple um, at a sort of high level. Um, famous scientist Robert Hooke encoded in, a, in a, an anagram the, 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 the statement, how, um, how hangs the flexible ch chain, so but inverted stands the masonry arch. And what that meant was that if you get all the, the stone blocks forming your arch and you hang them from a, a flexible weightless chain, you look at the, the profile of that, that uh, flexible chain, you flip it or invert it, and you can still fit that entirely within the masonry, then according to Hook, um, that masonry arch will stand. Conversely, um, if you can't fit a thrust line, um, this red line, um, line of compression now or line of thrust, 
you can't fit that entirely within the fitness of masonry, then simply your your structure will collapse when you take this, the formwork away, which is basically what William Edwards found when he was uh, attempting to construct the, the bridge at Ponty Pre. Um, so there are lots of possible lines of thrust, however. So if the abutments, for example, move slightly inwards or outwards, then you'll get a different line of thrust. Um, however, um, there is a limiting line of thrust. So in a single span bridge, if you apply a eccentric load, so a load around the sort of quarter span point, and you keep increasing that load, you would get to a point where you can only just fit that thrust line within the fitness of the masonry. If you apply any more load, then you get hinges forming and you then get um, collapse. And you can see here we've got a, a four hinge collapse mechanism and clearly um, the, 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 the structure is unstable and uh, um, we can't take any more load. Um, should also say that an arch bridge is not just an arch, not just the arch barrel, there's also the material around the arch um, in the in the spandrel area, but also behind the, the abutments as well. And that also matters quite significantly when it comes to load carrying capacity. So um actually got a, a load deflection plot. So if we were to um keep track of the amount of load applied to that the bridge if we've only got the the arch barrel or a bare arch rib then that's the blue plot as soon as we add backfill then typically we're talking about a 10 times increase in capacity and the reason for that is one it, it increases the um the self weight of the structure so it effectively pre-stresses it just the weight of the soil secondly it distributes the the loading through the soil um, onto the arch barrel so by the time the load hits the arch barrel it's, it's distributed it's spread and then lastly as the arch barrel tries to sway into the surrounding fill then you also get um, what's called passive resistance to that uh, um, that movement so basically um, infill is important and we've in the past um, carried out uh, quite a lot of tests on masonry arch bridges built inside uh, it's a large fish tank and what you can do is you can take photographs at each load step you can use digital imaging techniques to basically track the pixels and you can basically see how the, the soil arch interaction uh, works. I don't know how clearly it's coming up in your screen, but basically we're loading the, the structure at around the quarter span point, that's on the sort of the left-hand side, and then on the right-hand side, the arch is swaying into the applied, um, in, sorry, into the, into, into the surrounding fill, and we can see vectors showing the, the movement of the, of the soil. Um, particularly in the case of, of railway structures, particularly big viaducts and, and the like, we don't necessarily always have soil. Sometimes we have internal spandrel walls and then voids between those. And we've also uh, relatively recently been carrying out relatively small scale tests, uh, just verifying the, the, um, numerical models by doing these small scale tests. Here we've got a two span bridge where we're loading on, onto one of the uh, spandrel walls and then we've got uh, effectively downward movement of the left hand span and then upward movement of the, of the right hand span. Um, so experiments, um, all very well, but how do we actually um, calculate how much load is gonna be required to cause one of these structures to become unstable. Um, one way that, that's quite often um, performed is so-called mechanism analysis or, or limit analysis and what we're trying to do is model this structure at the point of collapse and one formulation is kind of outlined here 
um, on this slide. If you imagine you've got a, a single axle applied to a location on the two-span structure, then we've got the dispersal of the load through the fill onto the blocks, and between the blocks we've got contacts. And so we can pose this as an optimization problem where we maximize this applied load W subject to equilibrium constraints. So basically each block needs to be in equilibrium. So it needs to be an equilibrium in the, in the vertical sense, the horizontal sense, and also in the rotational sense. And every contact where we've got forces of shear, normal, and moment, those contacts potentially could, could yield um, in inverted commas. So they could slide, you could have sliding along that contact, or you could have rocking along that contact. And if the, the, the masonry has a finite strength, then the rocking could be accompanied by um, some crushing at, at the edges. So we can basically uh, develop this, this, this as an optimization problem. We could solve it using linear optimization methods, which are really, really quick, really, really um, effective. And we can very quickly um, explore how given structures uh, might behave under learning. So here we've got a three-span bridge where you can see we've got a, a railway uh, um, um, locomotive, uh, for example, on the, on the structure, and we have um, um, three hinges in the, in, the, in the loaded span, three hinges in the, uh, an adjacent unloaded span, and we have a, a single hinge at the base of an intermediate pier. So all this is done automatically using the, the rigorous uh, method that I've just outlined. So how does that relate to, to limit states, which is uh, um, the title of this uh, um, presentation? Um, the ultimate limit state is um, a state that we use a lot in, in structural engineering. And basically, it's the state beyond which failure of the bridge occurs. So we can see um, um, a laboratory model bridge um, tested some years ago, which is similar to the example that we, we showed um, in, in the numerical model, where we've got uh, um, hinges forming, and clearly um, the structure is, is, is at the point of collapse, basically. Um, so that's relatively straightforward to get your head around. Um, and in terms of the analysis calculations, basically as I outlined, um, what I didn't mention is that in addition to the distribution, so I was just introducing the permissible limit state, uh, which is the, the state beyond which long-term load-induced degradation occurs. Um, what I said was that uh, the ultimate limit state for most bridge owners is a slightly theoretical thing because Generally speaking, they don't find bridges collapsing uh, on a routine basis, except for perhaps via scour in, in flood events. So um, permissible limit state is potentially a more useful measure that will help them um, um, when they're managing their bridge stock. And what we can do is we can identify criteria which are, are um, known to be um, triggers of um, damaging behavior, which, which over time leads to gradual deterioration of a structure. So effectively what you can have is uh, uh, blocks, voussoirs, opening and closing under the action of um, normal traffic. And over time, that leads to um, a uh, deterioration of the structure um, and um, uh, the structure becoming unserviceable. So that's a system level um, criteria. Also, um, cyclic loading at the masonry material level can, can occur, which can, um, in some cases, uh, reduce the life of the, of the structure. So next slide shows uh, a, a, an example. Um, um, of a, a bridge that we, we tested in the laboratory. This is a three-meter span structure. It's actually a similar 
um, structure to the one you saw in the fish tank earlier. Um, in this case, however, we've applied cyclic loading to the structure to, to mimic a, a train um, or a, a road vehicle passing over um, structure repeatedly. And we're basically applying tens, hundreds of thousands of, of cycles to this, this structure at various different load levels. So you can see on the, on the graph, we're applying 50 kilonewton load um, repeatedly, 60 kilonewton, 66, 72, and so forth, until at a certain point, we have falling masonry, so some of the bricks fall out, and effectively the structure becomes unserviceable. So you can see that in this particular case, um, we're talking around the 84 kilonewton uh, region, we had uh, um, this kind of um, um, behavior occurring. So how do we um, um, identify that um, occurrence? Well, actually, in, in, in basic terms, um, if, we, if we neglect the, the passive resistance from the, from the soil, which we know requires quite large deformations to generate, and also if we use reduced or, or mobilized masonry mechanical properties, then effectively we can use the same kind of analysis that we use for the ultimate limit state to give us a permissible limit state. Um, so in the previous example, if we apply that simple analysis approach, then the permissible limit state load uh, in this case is, is, is calculated to be 72, which is a little bit lower than the 84 kilonewtons that the, um, the bridge actually um, um, took before it became unserviceable, but it's certainly uh, reasonably close and it's conservative, which is, is, is useful. So what happens if the permissible limit state load is exceeded? Um, this is one of the problems with masonry bridges because of those diverse range of construction details, which I mentioned earlier, um, you can see a huge range of symptoms um, to this overloading, but the root cause is, is in, in, in our view the same. You're effectively trying to mobilize too much capacity. You'll be, you're uh, above the permissible limit state um, load. Um, what does that mean for assessment? Um, basically means that we should be checking both the ultimate limit state for safety and also the permissible limit state um, for bridge management purposes. And in the case of the latter, that's particularly important if you um, are dealing with um, changes to the loads that uh, um, a structure is going to be um, subjected to. So, for example, if you're increasing axial loads, that's obvious, but also if you're changing the pattern of, of axial loads, that's, that's also important. Because if you recall from, from the, the hanging chain analogy, it's the pattern of loading in relation to the shape or the geometry of the structure that governs the, um, the stability. And just um, going back, I guess, to, to Paul's introduction, um, so some new guidance that the government commissioned um, is going to be released, uh, hopefully, in the next, uh, next, next few months, which is going to provide a lot more detail of this new um, um, technique, permissible limit state assessment technique. Um, so what I'm going to do is just, just uh, see, first of all, how this can be applied to a case study bridge. And it'll be a bridge that uh, one member of the audience uh, is, is very familiar with um, because it's uh, um, a, a bridge on the Stockton and Darlington Railway um, that um, I, I looked at with, with Dermot Kelly some years ago. The Stockton and Darlington Railway is, as everyone uh, probably here knows, is, is, the, is the world's oldest modern railway, opened in 1825. Um, the famous uh, bridge, the five pound note bridge is shown uh, on, on the screen there, but there's a much more modest bridge um, just down the line from that structure called Wiley Hill. And you can see it here. It's um, currently carrying a, a single uh, track. Um, 
span is small, 3.28 meters, um, but it appears to uh, actually date or predate the, the five palm note bridge because according to records, it was built in 1824. So it could be, we could be dealing with the, the world's oldest modern railway bridge. Um, situation from a, a sort of um, a bridge management point of view is it, it carried light passenger traffic for many years, but then um, coal traffic started to need to be carried and the, the wagons that uh, we, we used were these HHA wagons with down rated uh, 20 ton um, axles. What happened uh, when those coal uh, trains started crossing the structure, albeit at a, a relatively um, low uh, intensity, I think there were four coal trains a week, started to get quite large deformations at the Crown uh, and started to get concerns that this, the structure was, uh, was beyond the permissible limit state. Although when we looked at it at the time, uh, we weren't using that, 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 that terminology. In terms of the um, um, composition of the, of the, of the bridge, it, it's, it's stone voussoirs. Um, the fill material seems pretty poor. Um, waste materials are coal dust, ash, and doesn't look like the, uh, the fill material is capable of giving much distribution of the load through the soil. So here's um, actually an extract from, from that Syria guide where we're doing an analysis of, uh, of that bridge. Uh, and we're using, first of all, the, the current network rail standard with all the different um, partial factors of safety. And what that um, um, calculation tells us is that the adequacy factor, uh, which needs to be above one, to be acceptable, and if it's not above one, then it's unacceptable. It gives a, fa a number which is slightly above one. So this is saying that this structure should be okay. If we um, perform the, the new set of calculations, if we just perform the ULS, then again, that indicates that the structure should be okay. But with the new PLS, then that's clearly um, below one, 0.65, and that's um, basically telling us that this structure um, isn't in a happy place. Um, so in other words, continued traffic at this level will lead to long-term deterioration and um, damage to the, uh, to the structure. So, um, and this is uh, chronologically um, inaccurate um, because uh, the proposed solution was um, developed before we had developed the permissible limit state, but we could see that the structure was unserviceable. And so we were looking at ways to increase the strength of the structure without uh, um, you know, doing anything radical like um, 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 saddling the, the arch or putting some um, structure un underneath it. So, the proposed solution was to introduce a near surface, stiff, strong layer with the, the goal of distributing the load and alleviating the effects of live loading on the, on the arch barrel, basically. Um, and we had done some tests in the laboratory, which showed that if we put a, a near surface, strong, stiff layer on top of a structure, a relatively substantial one, we could significantly increase the ultimate limit state load and we could um, somewhat increase the initial stiffness of the structure as well. So the approach that we uh, adopted, um, this was in collaboration with um, Balfour BT Rail um, at the time using um, a, a technique called uh, Zyspan. Uh, is basically to inject the ballast with polymer. And if we do an analysis uh, with that polymer layer, then we can uh, basically identify certainly the uplift in, in ULS strength. We can use different calculations to assess how that impacts the stiffness. This is um, 
the uh, material, um, the impregnated um, ballast on top of, this, off top of the, um, the bridge in the lab. And we have uh, the lab um, set up shown there again. And we found that basically it could increase the stiffness and also the ultimate limit state load current capacity by up to around 50%. So that gave us confidence to apply the same technique to the, uh, the field bridge, Wiley Hill. So we've got above, we've got without the, um, the strong stiff layer, and then below we've got with the strong stiff layer. So we're basically uh, um, enhancing the um, uh, resilient res resistance of the, of the structure. And uh, um, so this was uh, basically done on site. Unfortunately, the, the re existing ballast was um, poor quality. So we actually initially had to um, remove the, the ballast and, and actually the, the, the fitness of the ballast was very, very low. So there was actually a, a sucking out using a vacuum system, um, all ballast and near surface fill. The reason he used a, a vacuum system was basically you've got to be very careful with masonry arch bridges that you remove the material in a, um, a symmetrical way uh, because clearly if you keep all the material on one side and have no material on the other side, then potentially it can become unstable and the structure can collapse. Uh, also, when you're pl using plant on the structure, then you've got to be very careful that you uh, you don't destabilize the uh, the structure. So basically, we were um, first of all changing the um, fill material, and then applying the um, Zeiss Zeiss track uh, to form the Zeiss span. Unfortunately, um, guess what? Sod's law came into into play. The coal trains were running until pretty much exactly the point at which we did the site works. And then as soon as the, um, the site works had been done, um, UK Coal, I think it was, went bankrupt and stopped the, running the coal trains. And so our, our perfect uh, before and after scenario uh, couldn't come to fruition. However, it was possible to run a, a classic six locomotive over the bridge and also passenger traffic continued as usual. So what did that show? It showed modest but measurable reductions in deflections under loads. And we've got here um, some plots with time. So before, well, initially, uh, the first thing that was done was that the track was moved positionally. And that led to some, some um, reductions in the, in the deflections. Then the, um, the ballast was changed. And then the, the Zeiss band was applied. And so we've got basically from a situation where in 2011 we were getting one millimeter displacement under passenger traffic to now where we're getting you know 20 30 percent less than that in terms of the the heavier load which were the real concern fortunately we don't have enough data to be to be concrete about this but the plus 66 loco that we had after again uh, it's, it's 20 30 percent um below the um, level of deflections um, beforehand. So um, I'm going to wrap up shortly, but just, just to say a few words about some research we're currently doing. Pretty much everything I've shown so far has been two-dimensional. Rail bridges um, are not two-dimensional, um, and often they, they contain 3D details. They, they might be skew, for example. Also, patterns of loading are 3D and often bridges respond in a 3D manner. So we're currently working um, with a number of industry partners to, to investigate this. Um, and when I say we, I'm referring to colleagues at the University of Sheffield and also at Leeds and Imperial College London. And the funder is basically the UK government through Research Council EPSRC. Um, what are we doing? Um, we're basically we're trying to understand first of all the behaviour better. So that's at the highest level of this uh, this this um, diagram. So we're doing experimental tests and also detailed modelling, so we can uh, um, potentially uh, understand better what's going on. 
Then in the middle layer, the green layer, we're developing practical tools, so similar to the, the tools that I've already shown um, applied to um, um, predict the, the collapse behavior of masonry bridges. And then lastly, um, to give impact, we've got lots of um, um, dissemination routes, so guidance, software, and so forth. Um, and this is um, a summary of some of the the, the latter things. Um, um, software tools include things like an online physics engine, so people can actually just play around with um, 3D masonry arch bridges um, to, to look at how they how they behave, uh, as well as uh, more um, um, rigorous um, software tools that can be used to actually compute the um, the amount of load required to cause um, either collapse or to exceed the permissible limit state. Um, and then finally, uh, just raise the, the possibility of a, of a renaissance in masonry arch bridges. Um, so we know these were constructed in very large numbers um, so for the canals, for the railways in the 19th century and, and into the early part of the 20th century. She's doing some work in, in, in uh, with colleagues um, at, at Arup in relation to HS2. It's quite a lot of um, Bridge, masonry arch bridges that actually date into the 1940s um, in the London area, but in very recent years um, they haven't been constructed um, widely at all. The question is, given that construction projects contribute very significantly to global carbon emissions, and that's the, the steel and concrete, and, and more specifically the cement in the concrete, um, very damaging. The question is, why do we um, need to get um, um, quarry stone, grind it up, mix it with cement and water to make a material which is potentially um, less strong than, than virgin um, st quarried stone? Um, potentially, we can reduce carbon emissions massively if we just use raw stone or potentially reclaim concrete from um, buildings or, or, or infrastructure that's no longer required. Um, so potentially, um, we could be seeing a renaissance in these structures. Uh, and then on this slide, uh, I've got a, actually a picture of a, uh, a, a bridge that has been constructed in, in, in relatively recent years, this is in, the, in the early 2000s, actually linking Bosnia with Herzegovina. Um, the reason this was constructed is, re is replacing a bridge that was bombed at the end of World War II, II by um, um, the Nazis as they were retreating, and it was a sort of symbolic uh, nature to actually rebuild this structure. But potentially we could be building these things in, in greater numbers. And that concludes my... Uh, presentation. So sorry about the uh, the sound issues, but hopefully you could hear me for the last uh, the last 15 minutes or so. Um, please feel free to to ask questions. Thank you very much, Matthew. I did put a uh, a note out to um, uh, the participants to uh, drop a, a line on the message. Um, board, but no one has um, uh, no one has actually posted anything yet. So it's over to the floor, I think. Hi, hi, Paul. It's Andy Andy P here. Um, thanks for that uh, presentation, Matthew. Uh, it's really interesting, as you, as you probably know. In, in my past, time. <laughs> I had quite a lot to do with masonry arches, and and it was a real, a real good trip down memory lane for me, and 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 also for one of my other colleagues who was also attending today. Um, and it was interesting at the, at the towards the end, you talked about the issue of reducing carbon, and and I I had sort of prepared a question about about uh, about that subject really, because uh, 
one thing about masonry arch bridges is they do seem to have been very very long lasting and, and really pretty resilient so the longer you can keep them going the less carbon you end up using in terms of new embodied carbon which uh, is a surprisingly significant amount of the carbon emissions um, of the of the railway uh, actually but my, my question was um, what what feel do you have at, at the moment for, for the sort of general state of the uh, British Railways um, masonry arch bridge stock is it in is it in reasonable condition uh, will it will it keep going for a lot longer uh, or, or are, are we losing some of the things that have been built before? Do, do, you, do you have any idea of, 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 or any feel for how that's looking at the moment? Um, it, it's a, a little bit, bit, bit tricky because I, I don't have access to a sort of a, a comprehensive data. Often I, I, I'm called in for troublesome cases where, where the structures are not in, in very good, good, good nick, so to speak. Um, so um, I, I couldn't say that I, um, I have a, a global feel. I mean, I think it's, it's patchy. I think there are, there are many structures which are, are doing very well, um, and, and as you say, are long-lived and don't show any cause for concern. There are other structures which um, much less well, and sometimes some of the um, the measures that have been taken to um, prolong their life. Um, you know, you know lack, uh, over the years and I'm not, I'm not pointing the finger at necessarily current current uh, engineers but s s some of them have, have lacked lacked logic um so i mean one of the things we're, we're hoping to do in the with the this new syria guide is is go right back to basics at the start of the guide which is to just talk about how these structures behave and if you understand how they behave then you can diagnose the root cause of um, things that you're seeing in the field and hence you can design um, suitable measures um, to, to to put them right rather than um, um, you know just just putting lots of um, metal bars here then everywhere and hoping for the best um, which, which 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 sometimes sometimes happens. So I, I, I'm ducking the question. Sorry, sorry, Andrew. It's good to see you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that that's good. And, and as you, as you just mentioned, uh, um, one of the great advantages of um, of, of arch structures um, is is that they're compressive structures, and and they don't have to deal, or well, they shouldn't have to deal too much with tension. And therefore, you don't need to go embedding bits of metal in concrete, which which um, you know can give cause uh, down the line to to to, to severe deterioration if uh, if you start to get corrosion of the metal bits. So um, yeah, a, com a completely compressive structure is 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 actually um, likely to be more resilient than other forms of structure. Yeah, so I'll I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Matthew. Yeah, just by some 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 um, messages in the chat. Shall I pick those up, Paul? Yeah, if you could, if you can see them, that would be great. Yep, yep. So the the last one, so I'm not going to do this, I'll, I'll do this in reverse or the one I can see at the moment is is from, from Dermot. There have been high, some high profile failures associated with spandrel and parapet walls. Will the new guidance address these issues? Um, I'm going to duck this one as well. So, so the, um, um, the, um, the guidance is very much on the sort of the load carrying capacity of the primary element, the masonry arch, barrel, and surrounding fill material, rather than of the, um, the spandrel walls or the parapet walls, for that matter. I mean, typically those elements um, can be found wanting, not just on a masonry bridge, but also in retaining walls and, and other contexts. Um, in relation to parapet walls, I am actually on the um, committee, British Standard Committee, for some new guidance or some new assessment um, guidance on impact of on masonry parapet walls, which is in the final stages of um, uh, of, of preparation. Um, I've got. Um, I should probably go to the top, shouldn't I? Rather than um, just a second. Um, let's have a look. Okay, um, 
what does Limit State Ring offer over Arch EM and other software packages for Arch analysis? So this is uh, a very specific question um, about um, about tool, proprietary tools that are used for masonry arch assessment. And I have to declare an interest here because uh, Limit State is a, a company that was spun out from University of Sheffield that I'm involved in and has actually produced the software that um, um, has produced the images, some of the images that I've shown on, on, on screen. Um, I don't That's think it's probably appropriate to go into, in, into lots of details on that. Um, one thing I could say that is relevant to the presentation is Limit State Ring uses optimization to identify the critical mode of response, whatever the um, um, the geometry or the loading conditions. So um, I've just got this picture here, this one. So for example, for multi-span structure, um, it will find the collapse mechanism where that involves um, any number of the spans, and it could also involve sliding failure, and it automatically comes up with the the maximum adequacy factor. Whereas ArchEM doesn't give you an adequacy factor, and it doesn't handle multi-span bridges in an automatic way. You have to manually adjust the thrust in that case. It also doesn't deal with um, multi-ring um, structures, which is, is actually why uh, the ring software was called um, Ring. It was it was it was actually developed for dealing with um, the analysis of of structures where you have separation of the of, of the adjacent rings of brickwork. Um, so next one from Joss. Um, could Matthew outline the current and future funding for the work being completed by the group of universities? Um, so I think I probably, um, I think I mentioned that on the slide. So there's 1.85 million pounds from the UK government that's basically being um, devoted to that. I would argue that it's it's a, it's a, it's a drop in the ocean considering the cost of of replacing, you know, just a handful of these bridges would 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 dwarf um, that number, um, but that. that that, that's, that's the amount of money we have at the moment, and hopefully we'll make uh, some, some steps forward, which will hopefully help us um, avoid demolishing bridges, um, replacing bridges or strengthening bridges unnecessarily. Uh, and also, um, if there are some, some safety concerns, justifiable safety concerns, to actually um, have tools that, that, that can clarify that and so suitable um, Action can be taken, I guess. Um, Thank you. I just... Thank you. Um, and then there's, I think this is another one from from Sam Clark. Um, how do we quantify PLS criteria with such a diverse range of possible defects? Um, so I think that m maybe overlaps with um, what I was saying about. It's easy to be bamboozled by the the range of symptoms that you see. Um, so the PLS you you apply to the sort of the main primary structure elements, and that leads to a whole range of defects. So often the defects you see are not the side effects of the um, the fact that you're trying to mobilise more more capacity than than than, than you justifiably can. They're not necessarily um, elements which feed directly into the the capacity itself, if if that makes any sense. So I think it's, e it's easy to sort of get overwhelmed when you deal deal with masonry arch bridges because you you do see so many different types of uh, of structure, different 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 details, and hence inevitably that leads to different defects when the PLS is is exceeded. And then um, just a couple before we finish, if, if, if you're happy for me to answer these, Paul, from Edward. Uh, it's one for um, Edward, yes. I think that's uh, I think that's the last one I can see. Okay, yes, it says some old brickwork arches have cast iron ribs embedded 
within the the barrel is the guidance on how to assess these structures. I think you're referring to jack arch structures, are you, Edward, where you effectively, where you have um, wrought iron or cast iron beams, then with small arches spanning between them, um, forming the deck. Is that, is that, I'm not 100% certain I'm, I'm um, um, perhaps you can unmute yourself and, and, and clarify. Yeah, uh, is... I might... can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I'm actually referring to like a normal brick uh, arch with okay. actually a cast iron following the, um, the shape of the ring, you know, but it's just embedded in brickwork. We had like uh, at least three of them I know in London. <laughs> and one of them actually had some issues because the cast iron rib was like a trough directly under the rail. So that one really had some uh, issues, that one. So okay. that's what I was um, asking. Guys. Yeah, yeah I, I guess I probably need to see those, but I'm, I'm, I haven't. I haven't come across uh, that particular design, so I'm not aware of it. There's certainly no specific guidance. I think it's, it's, it's kind of trying to apply, um, you know, going back to basics and applying basic engineering principles to to, to look at load paths and and and, and justify to yourself um, that you know how these things are working and and that they can carry on working in that way. But sometimes it can be tricky when. <laughs> Yeah, particularly if you have cast iron involved, that's always uh, um, um, you know, concerning if if you, if you don't understand exactly how it's working. Yes, it's less guidance on this. That's why I was asking. Yeah, Thank sorry, you. sorry, I'm not aware of any. Sorry, sorry about Edward. Okay, right. So what I suggest. Um, Let's let's give it ten seconds. If there's anybody who'd like to un unmute themselves and ask a question directly, this is your last chance to do so. Okay, so I think uh, uh, I think that's I think we'll we'll bring the uh, the presentation to a close now. So thanks very much indeed, Matthew. That's uh, that's a fascinating uh, fascinating uh, presentation today. Lots of lots of quite interesting to see the history there and the um, um, and the fact that we are doing a lot of research into um, masonry arch bridges. Uh, so rather than take um, um, Dermot's Seal Dermot's Thunder. Dermot's very, very kindly volunteered to do the vote of thanks. So I'm going to hand over to Dermot now. Thank you for a great presentation, Matthew. That was very interesting. Uh, it's great the way you took us through the uh, history of arches, where they were first used in Mesopotamia, how they work, uh, leading through to the limit states and how they're used. Particularly interested that uh, Robert Hook was involved in arches as well. That was a new one for me. Uh, it was great the way you described uh, ULS and PLS. I think for members of our audience who weren't familiar with those concepts, they particularly useful. Uh, brought back some wonderful memories of Wiley Hill to me. Uh, I love the memory that after we did all the work, we didn't have the heavy vehicles to test it, which was uh, interesting. Uh, the other interesting thing about that job, I think, was the heritage angle uh, that uh, we were proposing work, which didn't actually interfere with the visual appearance of the bridge. Uh, and that was part of the reason we got the funding. Uh, it's also interesting from an innovative point of view, uh, and I speak, think it speaks volumes about our industry, that we can introduce these ideas, make them work, but they don't get adopted. Uh, and that's certainly something we're looking at in my current role. Uh, the work you're doing for the future, I think, is absolutely essential and will add great value to our understanding. Uh, we do have lots of issues emerging with uh, masonry arch bridges, uh, and with 11,500 of them, uh, it's uh, certainly a big issue we're facing as a country. Uh, and I loved your comments about uh, we could be in line for renaissance of masonry arch bridges, and that's uh, certainly something I would support. 
uh, and look forward to. Uh, when we look at the stock of steel and concrete bridges we have, uh, which haven't lasted as long as mason arch bridges, we certainly do need to find a more sustainable and carbon neutral method of moving forward. Uh, so if everybody could uh, join me in uh, expressing our thanks for a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Now. Excellent. Well, again, yes, thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Matthew. Um, and thank you to all for attending this evening's uh, meeting. I um, uh, forgot the date actually of the next one, but looking forward to seeing you at the next meeting in November. So uh, I shall call the meeting to a close. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. This conference will now be